So, palm oil is the most widely produced oil crop currently. It's used in a wide range of industries, including food for biofuels and in soaps and shampoo. However, though sectors growing fast, and unfortunately palm oil grows in exactly the same environment as tropical rainforest. So, the use and the development of palm oil, the growth in the sector, is leading to wide-scale deforestation. What we are hoping to do is if we can come up an alternative we can slow the growth of the sector and therefore stop the wide-scale deforestation in South Asia. The earlier chocolate was quite unpalatable. They used to add things to it to make it more palatable, so for the early chocolate, they didn't know how to extract all the cocoa fat from it, so it was, or could be quite greasy, and if you made it as a drink you'd have this sort of scum on the top. So they used to try and add things to it, like starch and things, to make it a more palatable product. So there were a lot of or scandals around the kind of things they were adding to chocolate in the 19th century. So by the sort of 1870s, 1880s, there are people like Cadbury saying, our chocolate is absolutely pure. We have this new process, the Van Houten process, which now extracts all this horrible fat that we can use to make eating chocolate. Now we have a pure product. Every year, about 10 million tons of paper winds up in American landfills and incinerators, which is not only wasteful, but adds CO2 to the atmosphere recycling helps, but even that material has to be repulsed and paper-sized before you can use it to print out that recipe you ll never make. But what if you could wipe the page clean and use it again? Light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation to the rescue. A new study shows that laser light can erase the toner from a piece of printed paper. For all his fame and celebration, William Shakespeare remains a mysterious figure with regards to personal history. There are just two primary sources for information on the Bard, his works, and various legal and church documents that have survived from Elizabethan times. Naturally, there are many gaps in this body of information, which tells us little about Shakespeare, the man. Higher interest rates have knocked investors' confidence in putting their money into property, evidence suggests. The insurance company Standard Life says that the rate rises since last summer have led more people to question the wisdom of property investment.
You know, without getting into the details of exactly how that happened or how she got it out, let's just say it was a bad situation. And she panicked because, like for many of us, her phone is one of the most used and essential tools in her life. But, on the other hand, she had no idea how to fix it, because it's a completely mysterious black box. So, think about it, what would you do? What do you really understand about how your phone works? What are you willing to test or fix? For most people, the answer is, nothing. There are some 250 million cars in America, 250 million cars in the country with just over 300 million people. And most of those vehicles, of course, are gas-powered. This poses a huge challenge given the limited supplies of oil and the growing urgency of the global warming crisis. But there is good news, according to our guests today. And that is we have the know-how and the technology to build sleek, fast automobiles that don't use gasoline. These vehicles of tomorrow are powered by hydrogen, electricity, biofuels, and digital technology. And they already exist. You've heard about SARS, AIDS, and bird flu. Now researchers from Australia claim we're about to be hit by a new epidemic, motivational deficiency disorder. According to the British Medical Journal, one in five people are said to suffer from motivational deficiency disorder, or MOTID, and most don't even know they have it. Symptoms include being unable to get out of bed in the morning, being trapped on the couch. Obviously, this is all relevant to your final assignment. So we're going to talk about it. So until today, we've gone through face-to-face -face interviews as the main sort of part of interviewing the window. Today we're going to have a look at going to use an email and why they work, why they don't necessarily work, and what are the challenges and some of the things that we need to be understanding, you know, when we are completing such interpreters. So let's start with the foreign one. Obviously, there are a few benefits to them, and they are listed there up on that slide. It's obviously less stressful for those of you who might be a little bit anxious about interviewing. Dams are huge man-made structures that act as barriers on a river. Today, the main reason people build dams is to produce electricity. They are also built to restrict and control the flow of water in a river. Throughout history, dams have been used to prevent flooding and to irrigate farmland. Dams supply about a sixth of the world's electricity and they significantly reduce the risk of floods and droughts. They also make water easier to access, especially in desert-like areas, where water is in low supply. There are however, some negative effects of damming rivers.
Many people's homes are knocked down to make space for the dam, and flooding can occur in the reservoir, which is the area behind the dam where water collects. This can cause valuable farmland to become submerged under the lakes. Another way in which the industry exerts pressure on doctors is by offering us a variety of professional services. In one of these services, widely advertised to GPs, a company representative shows the practice manager how to use a company disk to trawl through the practice database identifying patients with problems which might be treatable with the company's products. When that has been done, a company-sponsored nurse interviews the selected patients and draws up a management plan for the GP which, if approved by the doctor, attracts a Medicare item number. One of these companies proudly announces that over 65,000 patients were assessed in this way in 2005. What, one may ask, is a pharmaceutical company doing assessing patients? It is surprising that no government or professional body has stepped in to prevent this commercially sponsored program. It is about a hundred years since that great Canadian-born physician Sir William Osler, Regius Professor of Medicine in Oxford, complained about the increasing influence of the pharmaceutical industry on the medical profession. He would be turning in his grave at the way the industry now dominates doctors' prescribing habits. It does this not only by direct and indirect pressure on the doctors themselves, but also by encouraging the public to ask for scripts. And one particular crop, almond in the US and now in Australia, is transforming the world of beekeeping and of bees. What has happened is that something serendipitous came along that people found out, that doctors found out that almonds are good for you, a confection, but it's good for you. The almond board got a very aggressive promotion going on for almonds. They actually, I just heard recently, send out sales reps to cardiologists at hospitals to promote the heart benefits of almonds. In a very good promotion of almonds, and it's legitimate promotion because they are a healthy food. Millions of roses get handed out on Valentine's Day. But growing roses has an environmental impact worse than many other crops. Start with climate change, most roses in the US and Europe are imported from warmer climes. All that flying and trucking adds thousands of metric tons of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Then there's all the water needed to, well, water the flowers. And the runoff fouled by copious quantities of pesticides needed to make the roses look perfect. There's also the wildlife and workers poisoned by all that fumigation.
Green chemistry is a concept designed to develop technologies which allow chemistry to be practiced with minimal damage to the environment or in an environmentally compatible way. And it's meant to cover both chemical processes and chemical products. The center, if you would, set up about seven or eight years ago, and the idea was to provide a hub of activities that covered fundamental research work, industrial collaboration, but also educational developments. So we work with schools and on public projects as well, and also networking. So we network out to well over 1,000 people around the globe. Well, the simple explanation might be that yesterday's sudden drop in share prices pretty much across the board has created what market analysts like to call a buying opportunity. It tends to bring out investors to pick through the ruins, looking for bargains decision by investors that sellers got a little carried away with things so the buyers have lifted all the major indexes today. The Dow, the Nasdaq, the S&P 500 were all up around half a percent in early trading today, and that wasn't a big surprise. Well, I'm absolutely delighted first of all to have been appointed to this professorship. The role is going to be about public engagement in science, it is about marketing science accessible to as wide an audience as possible, it's about making it easier for our academics here at the University of Birmingham to talk about their research to the general public and it's not just about a one-way flow of information, it very much is about dialogue. My current research at the moment is really quite broad. I work at the interface between the arts and humanities, particularly archaeology, but trying to find questions which are difficult to answer unless you start integrating computing and visualization so really, I work in this boundary between trying to understand cultural questions about the past, but those sorts of questions that you can't address unless you start reconstructing, start modeling and visualizing past landscapes objects and movement of people.